In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. When I was uh, young, we didn't own our own farm. We were renting farms, and our landlord was, I thought, the richest guy I knew. He owned those farms. He owned the Chevy Olds Pontiac dealership in town, and his wife had inherited a lot of money. I thought, man, they had it made. And his middle son, on his 16th birthday, was given by dad a brand new Chevy. And it was just, it was pretty cool. But, but Dave, his son, didn't seem to care much about it. He hot-rodded it, squealed the tires, fish tailing, carrying on, jump on the hood. He didn't, didn't seem to mean anything. And I was talking to my, my dad and my grandfather. We were pitching manure, which is where all the good conversations take place. Uh, because there's no machinery running, you know, and you can talk and pitch, talk and pitch, you know, back and forth. So we were talking this over, and I said, boy, you know, uh, that, that car of Dave's is really neat, but he sure doesn't seem to treat it very well. And my grandfather said, and I'll never forget this, he said, if it doesn't cost you anything, it doesn't mean anything. That kind of turns out to be true. I was thinking this week, I watched a little bit of the... Uh, Winter Olympics, and I thought, you know, I could go to any sports goods store and I could buy a trophy that says first place downhill super G, you know, slalom or something. And, and oh, that would be, wouldn't that be lovely? Well, no, because it'd be a big fat lie. I can't even ski. And secondly, what would it mean? It hadn't cost me any sweat, any work, any practice. What would it mean? It would mean nothing. And that's kind of the, the same thing, only on a different subject that we have in today's epistle lesson. The disciples in Rome were paying a price to be Christians. And this is a letter written probably by Silas under Peter's name. A letter written to the Christians at Rome to tell them to hang in there. I know you're under intense persecution, but remember the Lord is still the Lord. And remember the Lord went through persecution too. And you can expect the same thing. Hang in there. Glory awaits you. You'll be all right. This was, the background of this is that it's probably about 60 to 62 AD. And this is when uh, Nero was the emperor of Rome. And if you remember any of your ancient history about Nero, by all accounts, he was nuts. And, uh, he, you know, the, the phrase, Nero fiddled while Rome burned, uh, he, you know, he... He was, uh, well, in the first place, all the emperors had to marry into their same family. So, you know, by this time, they were as inbred as a bunch of dogs in a puppy factory. And so you can expect that kind of stuff to happen. And it did. And uh, Nero had already uh, kicked his mother to death. He had already kicked somebody else to death. He, uh, he kicked out all the Jews from Rome. He left the Christians, this new sect of Judaism, the Christians, because he found them entertaining. And the entertainment was he liked to throw them in with lions at the Colosseum and see what would happen. And I can tell you what happened. They got torn apart. He also liked to uh, wrap the Christians up in, all the way up in oil skins and then light them like human candles to see how they would burn. Another one of his favorites was to bury, bury people, Christians up to their neck in the dirt and then pour honey all over their heads and let the wild pigs chew their heads off. This is Nero. He, he was crazier than an outhouse rat. And this is what the Christians in Rome were having to put up with. And so they wrote them. But the funny thing is, or the amazing thing is, that even though all this persecution was taking place, Christianity was exploding in that area. There was more and more people becoming Christians all the time. And a century later, persecution was still going on, the, the uh, church father Tertullian said, here's a quote from him. He said, the blood of Christians is the seed of the church. The more we are mown down, the more in number we grow, unquote. That's pretty remarkable. The more persecution there was, the more Christianity seemed to explode. But the same thing happens today. If you've been reading a Christian Century or any other publications, you would know that where it's where it costs somebody something to be a Christian, that's where Christianity is really growing. Parts of China, Korea, some South American place, African, places like that. That's where it's really exploding. 
but it cost them something to be a Christian there. And uh, I, I was reading a couple of stories. One was a woman by the name of Margaret Chu. She was a, in a labor camp in China during the Mao era. And uh, she was kept there because she refused to renounce her Catholic Christian faith. And then there was another fellow in the Sudan who was beaten every day in a prison by Muslim guards because he refused to renounce his Christianity. Both of them were able to escape at various times, and they both made their way to America. And they both said the same kind of thing. They said they were just overwhelmed at the kind of freedom to worship however you wanted that there was in America. They could worship anytime, anywhere, with anybody they wanted to. It was just overwhelming to them. But the thing that made them wonder, and they were dismayed and chagrined to see that the people who lived in America didn't seem to care one way or another about that. No big deal. And most of the people around them didn't worship, didn't, didn't do anything religious that they noticed. And they just they wondered about that. How can that be? Christian writer C.S. Lewis of Chronicles of Narnia fame uh, one time said, he said, I think that the devil has changed his strategy. I think that he told his minions, don't make it hard to be a Christian. Make it easy for them. And soon they will not care about it at all. And that does seem to happen. It does seem to happen. Now, I don't know if it's going to take some, you know, I remember a pastor saying a few years ago, it's going to take a lot of persecution before America turns around and realizes what it's got in terms of we need to worship God and, and follow Christ. Well, I would hate to think we'd have to have that in order for us to turn around and, and follow the Lord, but who knows? Uh, I was reading a survey, it was I think University of Houston about seven, eight years ago. It's a little dated, but I still remember it. And it said that uh, in their survey, 44% of the people believed that there was no sense in uh, trying to gain any, uh, any wisdom uh, about, you know, from the church or holy writings. And 19% said in the survey that they didn't think that it made sense to even try to find any meaning in life, which, which is pretty grim. It's pretty grim stuff. But... Here's the thing. Well, I don't know what's going to happen in America. Persecuted, not persecuted. But right now, we're not. Except for school and church shootings, we're not under a lot of pressure just culturally. So right now, we're not in any danger of being persecuted. We are in danger of being patronized. Maybe not in danger of persecution, but certainly in danger of being patted on the head. It's, oh, oh you, you like that, that Christian stuff? That's fine, Mom. Go ahead. You know, you, if you like that antiquated, irrelevant stuff, you know, feel free. That's what parents hear if they're honest with you. So we're not in danger of persecution. We're in danger of being severely poo-pooed because it's easy. Well, even though we're not under that you know, kind of corporate persecution, uh, I would tell you this, people are still watching you for your personal trials and tribulations. Maybe not over being a Christian, but watching you as a Christian. They're watching you to know, how is it that you meet calamity with serenity? How is it that you meet grief with hope? How is it that you meet derision with acceptance? Where do you get that stuff? How are you doing that? What is there in you that allows you to do that? People are still looking. People are still watching that. And so whatever happens, I don't know, whatever government what there is, whatever persecution there is, whatever time we're living in, be aware of this. God is still God. The Lord is still the Lord. And one day we're going to stand there and, and face Him. He's going to be back. He's going to take us as His special children. And he is going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.